Albert Fish was a serial predator who stalked the streets of New York in the 1920s and 1930s. He admitted to preying upon only the most vulnerable victims he could think of, simply because he thought they wouldn't be missed. It's estimated that he literally murdered dozens of children and sexually assaulted over a hundred more. His sadistic methods of torture earned him the blood-curdling nickname, the Brooklyn Vampire. This is the case of Albert Fish, the real-life bogeyman. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. Well, you have asked for this case many, many times, but I was resistant initially because it's been covered a lot and then found myself completely entrenched in the psychiatric and psychological reports and evaluations that people have done on him since his death. Essentially, I appreciate that Albert Fish was not present during these actual evaluations, but nonetheless, the insight that I've gained and garnered from those particular studies have been really helpful. So hopefully I'm gonna be able to interweave that. So if you've seen Albert Fish covered 6,973 times, you will still be able to watch this and go away with a little bit of extra information. If you're new to my channel, I release my content every Wednesday and Sunday. So if you like crime and consistency, this is definitely the space and place for you. Also, I am gonna be dropping videos occasionally on other dates because I love you and you're amazing. So whenever I get time, I like to additionalize my content. Those of you who are subscribing on Patreon, as you'll see, I am building up my content there as promised, and YouTube membership, I'm also just doing little bits and pieces to make your membership worthwhile, including getting to watch some of my content earlier than other people, because without you, cannot make this content. It's as simple as that. You'll also know I'm in a unusual t-shirt that I haven't had before. Yes, it's my do not comply, but this time it's red camo. And the reason for that is a lot of you, when we did my red camo drop hoodies, requested whether I could do some more red ones. And this is what I have created. So if you do want to buy one of these, it's gonna be for a limited period. So we won't be doing this again. You can also get it in blue and arguably with the holiday season being upon us, it might make somebody a perfect Christmas present or even a Christmas present for you. If you're watching this next April, the drop will probably have gone. <laughs> so apologies for that. Right, let's move on with today's case. One of my most requested. So who was Albert Fish? Well, born Hamilton Howard Fish in Washington, DC. That was on May the 19th, 1870. He was born to his father who was named Randall Fish, his mother was named Ellen Frances Howell. Randall, his dad, was actually 43 years older than his wife. So his dad was 75 years at the time of Hamilton's birth. He was the youngest of four children. So there was also Walter, Annie and Edward above him. And he was given the name Ham and Eggs in his youth. And he really didn't like that. In fact, he was so disconcerted by the fact that people would call him Ham and Eggs that Fish changed his name from Hamilton to Albert and he apparently chose that name because it was one of his dead siblings. Back in the day we were all very aware that childhood mortality rates were actually very high and it was not uncommon to have lost a sibling early on in your life. So he uses that name and moves forward with the name Albert. The family actually had quite a history of mental illness. So one of his uncles had mania, one of his brothers was confined to a state mental hospital, his sister Annie. She was diagnosed with mental affliction, just to put that out there. That means that they didn't actually know what was wrong, but there was something going on. And actually this happened quite a lot back in the olden days where somebody would be atypical in their behavior, but there wasn't necessarily something that they could specifically diagnose. It was just an oddness or there was a decline in the way that they were acting for a period of time and they would just say it was a mental affliction. His mother also had oral and visual hallucinations, sometimes separately, sometimes together. 
So we're being brought into areas such as psychosis there or schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. These are all potentials that his mother was dealing with, but understandably we're talking about a long time ago and classification and diagnostics have changed a great deal since then. Now, Fish's family health history, including what I've just said, also had at least seven relatives in the two previous generations with mental disorders and two of them had died in asylums. Now, that isn't suggesting that somebody like Albert Fish becomes who he is because of mental illness, you will be mentally ill as a human being and that will not cause you in any way, shape or form to go out and do horrible things to other people. Quite the contrary. You might be more likely to harm yourself, but you're certainly not going to become a murderer. However, you can also be a murderer with a predisposition for that, such as psychopathy and arguably then develop a mental illness as well. Fish's father, who was a fertiliser manufacturer and a former riverboat captain, he actually suffered a fatal heart attack at the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station. That was on October the 16th, 1875. But we have to also appreciate he was getting on in years back in the day. Like I said, when Fish was born, his father was 75. So it's not that he didn't have a long life. It's just that he had a life that unfortunately didn't extend his fathering opportunities to his son because of the age gap between him and his wife. Ellen, she really struggled with the loss of her husband. She had quite a few children. There would have been a huge amount of stress involved in the grief process and also the financial implications for a woman who has lost a partner and has a considerable amount of children. It's going to be difficult. And understandably, when we think about mental illness and stress, you're going to see an issue with coping. And indeed, she gets hallucinations that are very severe. And at this point, because she genuinely can't really take care of her children in the way that she wishes to, she ends up placing fish in St. John's Orphanage in Washington, D.C. This is when he's younger and it's horrible for him. So I'm sure there's a lot of you will already know that orphanages ran by nuns, which one would imagine and conceptualise as being a place, I don't know, of kindness and compassion, bearing in mind they're meant to literally be the wives of Jesus running these places. But apparently they didn't get the memo on that because a lot of orphanages back at the time where fish was operating and growing up were not, shall we say, very nice. And indeed, as we will see in future videos, and certainly I've covered in a few past videos, in these environments, children can often be open to a huge amount of abuse, parents aren't present, and there's a whole heap of toxicity, and also, I would say, neurotic behaviour by certain individuals who maybe went down that road to work in these positions, such as nuns running schools back in the day. So he ends up getting really badly beaten by other children, because no one's taking care of the situation, so no one's protecting him. They're just left to their own devices when the nuns aren't around. And then he's also beaten and by the nuns. Of course he is. At the end of the day, when you've got bad behaviour, why don't we just beat it out of you? That's going to be an effective strategy, isn't it? But it's been documented that it was so severe, the way that the nuns treated the children there, that they would essentially shred the children's clothes off, they'd severely beat them, they'd whip them, and then they'd exacerbate the horror of that experience by literally forcing all the other students to watch. Now that's a severe form of shame punishing, and it's going to have massive implications for the children who endure that, because essentially you're already feeling helpless, you've not got your parents available to you. Then you feel powerless, because you have these people who are going to care for you, being absolutely horrific towards you and then you're humiliated because the people that you know your peers are watching that take place and for the peers watching that's also a form of abuse because essentially you're being traumatized by the witnessing of these incidents so it would be a whole heap of horror for the children including for fish who was there at the time but something shifts it's not long before fish begins to enjoy these beatings and apparently he used to even get erections and climax at times when he was being beaten. And it feels as if this also then exposes him to a fantasy about how it would be to attack others 
So he's enjoying it, so to speak. He's getting his kicks from these kind of horrific beatings. So how would it be if he were to then start to beat other children? And that's what he does. He starts to attack other kids and he also starts to self-harm at a quite a high level. So he would burn himself with ropes. He would swallow needles, which is a really high level of self-abuse. And also he starts to begin reading books and articles about criminals. Now, if you think about being a child in that kind of an environment, as I've just described, you have very little power, very little control. And it can be very difficult to understand how on earth a child could start to get titillated by this level of toxic abuse because it goes against the grain for the vast majority of us. When we think about childhood, we think about it being a safe place and a safe space, an environment where we can be looked after and protected and loved. And the problem you have when you're in care and when you're in care with abusive individuals around you, you have an issue regarding attention because there isn't any positive attention available. You're getting beaten up by the kids around you. You're getting beaten up by the people there who are meant to educate and protect you. And this can split into different paradigms emotionally. So first of all, what we know is that a child's brain does better if it's beaten, as in the child is being beaten and physically abused, than it does if it's ignored. It's bizarre, but neglect seems to be the one type of abuse that is catastrophic for the brain. So you look at a neglected brain versus an attended brain, and they are totally different. The neglected brain is far smaller, etc. Now, obviously, no child enjoys physical abuse, but at least that is something that comes into contact. It means you're visible. It means you're noticed. It's awful. No child should ever go through it. But it's preferable on a brain level than being completely ignored. So it can be that Fish is starting to tolerate the beating or enjoy the beating because arguably at least it means he's being noticed. Noticed in the wrong way, but noticed nonetheless and young children struggle to differentiate between good attention and bad attention so that's playing in secondly what about power what about taking the power back to some degree so he's helpless he's a child he's being beaten and they win if he struggles with that they win if he's in agony they win if he doesn't enjoy it so he develops a mindset potentially to actually engage with it on a pleasurable level so that they don't have any power. Now he's the one in charge. And when you think about him self-harming too, clearly we're being introduced to somebody who is probably emotionally overwhelmed and overburdened. So the harm manages to help him deflect from that burden, from the mental to the physical, and that might give him some kind of temporary alleviation from the emotional overwhelming experience that he's dealing with on a day-to-day -day level there. So all of those things can play in. And when we look at sadomasochism, but we're looking at it more on a paraphilia level, so where it becomes a real classification level of issue with your sexual conduct, we would expect it to start in early childhood. And I think that all of those things could play in to why he starts to enjoy that kind of abuse. And obviously we can add to that that the brain is unbelievable. It's just the most incredible organ that we have without a shadow of a doubt. But it has neural pathways and new neural pathways are being formed and forged all the time. And his brain can be conditioned to feel in a certain way. The more he attends to a particular behavior, the more he connects to the particular behavior. So the feedback that we would expect to be giving him, shall we say, painful sensations could eventually be reprogrammed to give him positive sensations. Also, he stops reading a lot of books about criminals, a lot of articles about criminals, but let's sort of just draw a line under that one. I don't think that reading about criminals or reading articles and books about them is going to make you a little bit like fish. I think everybody here watching would be a bit upset to imagine that. Let's be honest, all I do is read articles and watch information these days about criminals. So I think we should just discount that one particularly. In 1880, Fisher's life is about to change again. So his mother manages to secure a government job. So now she's got balance in her life. So she decides that she's gonna remove him from the orphanage. But I would say there has been a lot of damage done. So by this time, Fish is already known for just running away and absconding from the home most Saturdays. Just gonna throw it out there. I would understand why. I can't imagine that staying in the orphanage is something that's that pleasurable. Having described the kind of things that the nuns, Hail Mary, Amen, get up to, it's so weird that 
you read historically about how these individuals were genuinely meant to care for these children and actually just destroyed them. So he's absconding regularly. This is most Saturdays. In addition to this, he's frequently wetting his bed up until the age of 11. So think about the McDonald triad created by John McDonald. The theory is that in psychopathy, when it comes down to psychopathic serial killers in particular, you're going to see things like bedwetting, animal torture, and also you'll see things like pyromania. So fire starting and People do criticise McDonald because they say that bedwetting is also linked to abuse, but it is. But you can have a person who is psychopathic and inclined towards serial killing with those traits who can also be an individual who's been horribly traumatised and abused. And that would be the case where Fish is concerned. He also, after returning home to his mum, has quite a serious force. He falls from a cherry tree. And it gives Fish a really serious concussion, and that concussion led to subsequent headaches, dizzy spells, and even a severe stutter. So we're talking about quite a traumatic brain injury then, particularly where the stutter is concerned, because I don't have the evidence or information in front of me. But what I would argue is that there is a strong possibility that when he fell and hit his head, he did suffer quite a serious head injury and even potentially a small stroke, because a severe stutter would evidence that we see that play out in these situations and you think about frontal lobe damage that is often talked about and documented in the literature regarding individuals who shall we say have issues with their behavior and impulse control that could also be a contributor to forming the man that we end up looking at he had very little formal education so when he was growing up he basically learned to work more with his hands that's why down the line he becomes a decorator by the age of 12, 12, he ends up in a relationship with a telegraph boy. And this telegraph boy is perverted. It's as simple as that. Now, I'm not condemning this person. I'm saying that whatever created them led to perversions that were very dark. And unfortunately, he introduces Albert Fish to these. So he introduces him to things such as drinking his own urine, which is urolagnia, or eating his own feces, which is coprophilia. And he's 12, so he's a child. And that's deeply concerning and quite sinister when you consider that kind of behavior. I do appreciate that there are a tiny percentage of individuals who do those things to sexually satisfy themselves, but it's incredibly rare. Albert also starts to visit public bathrooms. This is when he's a kid. And the whole premise of this is that he wants to watch other young boys undress. This is all for his own personal sexual gratification. It's a behaviour known as scopophilia. And he actually did this most weekends. You know, when the rest of us were thinking about, I don't know, maybe popping to the shops with our friends. Or maybe going and doing some sports in a park. Just, you know, the innocent, naive joy of being little. But not for Fish. Fish decided that just being a sexual predator from an early age was really for him. And when you look back at serial killers and you consider how they operate throughout their childhoods, they graduate criminally. And we would expect to see this kind of sexual predatory behaviour becoming a feature in his world. And it clearly does. So it's clear by now there is a high level of dysfunction. We've got a traumatic brain injury. We've got Lots of problematic situations with the mental health within the family generationally. We've also got the displacement because of the fact that he was living with his mother. He's been sent to a school with nuns and a boarding school at that. And now he's been returned. So there's been a lot of emotional, psychological and social experiences that haven't been too positive. And then we can additionalise that with trauma and stress, which he would definitely have encountered during his stay with the nuns. And on top of that, we have this, what I would consider sadistic quality evolving in the way that he experiences his sexual pleasure and also the masochistic tendencies regarding the self-harm that gives him again, another pleasurable kick from sexual experiences that many of us would find deeply harmful. Most of us can't imagine putting needles in ourselves or setting fire to ourselves and getting any pleasure from it. We would consider that emotional abuse and psychological abuse and physical abuse all in one, but he's not getting those kickbacks as we would expect, and that's disturbing. Now, when Fish is 20, this is back in 1890, he moves to New York City and he apparently, allegedly, works as a sex worker. And this is where he begins to molest and rape boys. And he has a particular 
predilection for boys who are younger than six years of age, so very young children. The way that he would work to do this, his MO was basically to lure them from the homes. He'd then torture them in various ways. And he had apparently this favorite method and it was using a paddle, which was laced with sharp nails before then finally raping them, which is just absolutely harrowing. I'm sure so many of you have got experiences with six-year-old children on the basis that they'll belong to you, you know, they'll be part of your family. We all know what it was like to be six. The horror that they must have endured with this man basically molesting them, raping them, and abusing them with a paddle laced with sharp nails. That is the stuff of worst nightmares. And Fish actually recounted down the line an incident in which a male lover took him to this wax museum. And he said he became really fascinated by a bisection of a human penis. And apparently he subsequently became absolutely obsessed with sexual mutilation. So clearly we are now looking at a very dangerous man and he's without a doubt suffering from sexual sadism. And when we talk about sexual sadism at a classification level, it involves the infliction of physical or psychological suffering. So like humiliation, terror, etc., on another individual. And that is done purely to stimulate sexual excitement and orgasm. Now, sexual sadism disorder is sexual sadism that actually causes clinically significant distress or even functional impairment with a non-consenting person. So we're not talking about s and We're not talking about BDSM where people are consenting and enjoying it. We're talking about a sexual sadist in this level is somebody who is enjoying themselves because you have no choice and you are not enjoying yourself, quite the contrary. You are scared, horrified, terrified and in agony. We get to 1898 and at this point, Fish's mother decides that it's time for him to get married. So she basically arranges a marriage for him with a woman called Anna Mary Hoffman. She's nine years younger than him, but I guess to Fish's mother, that's not gonna be an issue bearing in mind. There was a massive age gap between her and her own husband. But it's interesting that mum has got involved and one imagines that she had an inkling that there was something not right with her son. And she felt that there was a need for balance, boundaries, opportunity to create a family to distract him or dissuade him from his lifestyle and that by providing him with an appropriate suitor this could lead to him living a more pro-social life a more acceptable life and i would say that fish gives it a good go in certain ways so they had six children together that was albert anna gertrude eugene john and henry but by 1903 one of the problems within their relationship is that Fish has begun to rack up a hell of a lot of criminal acts that basically lead to charges. They include charges of grand larceny, petty theft, and also something that stays with him throughout his life, which is this absolute obsession with the writing of obscene letters. And apparently some of the letters that he wrote to people were so disgusting that they could not be repeated. Even though all of those things were true, he was only actually convicted for a single count of grand larceny. He gets incarcerated at Sing Sing, which is a maximum security prison in New York. Now, several years later, this is around 1910, Fish is working in Wilmington, Delaware. This is where he meets a 19-year-old man named Thomas Kedham. And the two, well, essentially they begin a sadomasochistic relationship. It is unclear as to whether or not Fish forced Kedden to do these things, but his confession implies that Kedden was actually intellectually disabled. So even if Kedden was a willing participant, I don't think he could consent because he didn't have the understanding intellectually to be able to do so. And if you think about somebody like Fish, I think his pleasure came from others' pain and not others' enjoyment of pain. So it could well be that unfortunately for Kedden, he was being abused and coerced into these situations by Fish. Now, after they've got into this relationship, after about 10 days, Fish takes Kedden to this old farmhouse. Apparently, he tortured him there over a period of two weeks. Fish eventually ties Kedden up, cuts off half his penis, and he said, I shall never forget his scream or the look he gave me. I don't think any of us needed that description, Fish, because with respect, I don't think any of us could imagine that it wouldn't be a scream you'd remember if you had physically cut off 
half of someone's penis. I imagine for a man, that scream would go on as far as they were concerned for years. Because you are literally removing the manhood. But this is what he did. And he can never forget the way that the guy screamed or looked at him. His original intention as well, aside from doing all this brutal torture to Kedden, was to actually kill him. He was going to cut up his body, he was going to take it home with him, but apparently he feared that the hot weather would draw attention to him. Just going to throw it out there, Mr. Fish. Probably Kedden's screaming like no one had ever screamed before could potentially have also drawn attention to you. But anyway, he abandons this plan and instead Albert Fish pours peroxide over the wound, wraps it in a Vaseline-covered handkerchief, leaves Kedden a $10 bill, kisses him, goodbye, and then leaves. That is literally the worst date ever. Fish later remarked that he took the first train that he could to get home and he never ever heard of what had become of him and he never even tried to find out. But the injury itself there is terrifying to imagine. Can you imagine the level of infection that can get in, particularly if you've got an individual who maybe is vulnerable? And again, we're introduced to the reality that Fish is looking at doing these things to the most vulnerable people in our society. And that is definitely a feature within all of his crimes. Now, you won't be surprised to find out that his marriage doesn't last forever. So in January 1917, initially, Fish's wife leaves him for John Stroud. This is a guy who's a handyman. He was boarding with the Fish family. Fish did actually take his wife back. And at this point, the condition was that she had to send a lover away. And she said, yeah, of course I will. Of course I will send my lover away. But what she actually did was she hid him in the attic. And that carried on until he was discovered in said attic. And at this point, she left fish for good. And the two of them ran away together, reportedly taking nearly every possession that was in the family home. So fish was left with the children. And it seems not very much else. So Albert then has to raise his kids as a single parent. And again, we're introduced to stress. And where we see stress, we see an exacerbation on the whole and amplification in mental health issues. When you have existing mental illness, this is usually something that will cause an increase in these problems. And he starts having auditory hallucinations, much like his mother did. And it gets really severe. So he once wraps himself in carpet, said he was following the instructions of John the Apostle. And his children said that the change in his behaviour was really marked after his mother left. Apparently, the hallucinations were so bad that at times he would stand outside and he'd shake his fist at the sky and say, I am Christ. And at this point, he became really obsessed with sin and sacrifice and also atonement through pain. So now he's got what I would consider as a religious mania as well. So he's using his religious inclination to justify his desire to seek pain and to fulfill that pain on a sexual level using what he would suggest is atonement. Also, think about the fact that he's starting to become obsessed with sin and sacrifice. That doesn't really bode well for future people he meets who might fit his victim profile, because now he's buying in with this whole idea, I am Christ, and at the end of the day, I am somebody who needs to atone with pain, sin, and sacrifice. It's giving him a marked justification, shall we say, for potential future actions. And the self-harm now gets really bad. And when I use the word self-harm with Albert Fish, it's quite challenging because understandably, when we think about self-harm, and I appreciate that some of you listening right now, you will have endured self-harm yourself. Personally, some of you might be doing it now. And you are not doing it because it's fun or enjoyable or giving you sexual thrills. You are doing it for quite the contrary. You are dealing with an absolutely overwhelming experience of this emotional pain. And it's so intensely agonizing. It's so deeply overwhelming that in those moments where you're just in a situation where you need to survive, you use harm to deflect from the agony here and to just temporarily put it here. You don't enjoy it, quite the contrary. Yes, it may be that after you do that for a moment, you just get a little bit of calm because you've displaced that agony in that situation for a very temporary period of time. But there's no sexual pleasure. But I'm using the word self-harm because it's the only way I can describe what he's doing because he's the person who is doing it to himself, essentially. And he has this real 
joy, I would say, and real enjoyment of sticking and embedding needles into his groin and abdomen. It's called pickerism. He also begins to stuff wool, which was covered in lighter fuel, into his anus, and he set that on fire. So what we know about psychopaths, and without a doubt, Albert Fish is a psychopath, we know that their pain threshold is different to your eyes. So they don't feel emotional pain in the same way as us, if at all at times. And that actually translates to physical pain. So psychopaths have a higher pain tolerance. So even though for most of us we're thinking, what the hell? Why would you put wool covered in lighter fuel in one of the most sensitive areas of your body, your anus, and set that on fire? Well, if you don't feel very much, because you don't have the capacity to do so, you're gonna wanna feel something. And so you do things that are quite extreme that to people with a normal regulated sense of self and vocabulary of emotion would think was absolutely bizarre and agonizing. But for you, because you don't have the feedback in the brain as it should work, it just feels like feeling something. Now, occasionally, when he's bringing his children up, he would actually ask them to participate in this sadomasochism that he had within his psyche. And he would get them to play games. So in one of the games, he asked his kids to paddle him. As I've noted before, he had that particular connection with the nail-filled paddle. So that's what he got them to do. And he asked them to paddle him until blood was literally running down his legs. That is highly abusive towards his children. I appreciate that they're the ones essentially inflicting pain on him, but can you imagine being a child? It's so challenging. You have a primary caregiver and they're asking you specifically to do something and you're in a situation where of course you don't want to do it, but arguably, what choice do you have? Your dad's saying, this is what you need to do. You're being coerced into this really awful position emotionally, psychologically, but where do you go otherwise? So his children would be suffering a great deal and the way that will have impacted on them will have been enormous. Albert also starts to eat raw meat and he actually invited his kids to share this food with him. And again, I imagine that put them in some really awful positions because I'm just gonna throw it out there. When I was a kid, growing up at a very different point in time and history, my parents would say things like this if I didn't finish my meal. What do you think the kids in Ethiopia would do? Do you think they'd eat their meal? I, I, I genuinely do think that the kids involved and experiencing a horrific famine would probably finish their pie mum. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. Right, well, you need to finish yours. I feel like there is a massive cultural divide and experience between myself and the kids in Ethiopia, but that means that you don't appreciate it, which means that you don't care about the kids in Ethiopia. I think that's really un I care deeply about the kids in Ethiopia it's just I'm not one of them and they are hungry and I don't like your pie that's how it was when I was growing up you literally got into trouble the people would be like you're not leaving the table until you finish your food but I'm really full well just stay at that table how long until you finish your food what if I can't finish my food till I don't know five hours time well enjoy sitting there that's how it was <laughs> Not abusive, I appreciate, but it was weird. It was a weird time and you were forced. So I can imagine that he's inviting these kids to eat this raw meat and a lot of the time they would have to do it because dad's saying I should. So his marriage has ended, dysfunction is growing and now we see the return of something that he really connects with, which is this sharing really grotesque letters with people who don't want it. It's completely unwarranted. So he starts to write to women listed in the personal columns of newspapers. And within the letters that he writes, he describes in graphic detail the sexual acts he would like to share with them. Can you imagine being one of those ladies back in the day? Ladies were ladies, weren't they? A lot of them would have been quite prim and proper, particularly those advertising the classified ads, probably looking for a husband after bereavement, a suitor that would be right for them and then 
you get an excited, a letter arrives, you're thinking to yourself, oh, this could be it, this could be the one, this could be Prince Charming, the man of my dreams, and you get a letter off Fish. The guy is so depraved in your first connection, it's not, you know, what are your interests, what are your hobbies, why don't you write back to me and we'll get involved in this nice pen pal ship before we finally meet for, I don't know, afternoon tea somewhere. But no, just his absolute ludicrous and incredibly extreme ideas of what is appropriate sexually to just throw all of that at some innocent victim and the problem is that that person is a victim because it's traumatizing it's highly traumatizing because one of the things that you're looking at is why is this person decided that they're going to write to me it makes people feel really vulnerable it makes people feel quite scared and it's a violation i appreciate it's a non-contact crime but it's a violation and it demonstrates just how predatory he is, but also how he's living in fantasy. Because when he's writing those letters, it's not even about meeting these women. It's just about getting it down on paper because he's titillated by it and then knowing it's going to traumatise the person who reads it. And the descriptions were apparently so vile that they were never made public. They were submitted down the line as evidence in court, but the women who received them, they were horrified. And you won't be surprised to know that according to Albert Fish, no woman actually responded to his letters. Do I? I mean, I do realise that we're living in quite a liberal age these days, but I think most people would be pretty much put off by some random writing to them, discussing the most depraved thoughts sexually and asking whether they'd come over and beat them up for them, because that's what he was doing. He was saying, can you come and sadistically attack me, because that's what turns me on. Now we get to the escalation. So the escalation is between really 1919, 1930, and this is when he begins to pay boys to actually go and procure other children for him to sexually abuse and torture. So Fish would choose children who were either mentally disabled or he'd go for African-American children because he felt that he assumed that those type of individuals wouldn't be missed if he killed them, which again just goes to show that his grasp on emotion is completely warped. The idea that a child who's disabled or who's black wouldn't be absolutely doted on by the parents is bizarre that's his mindset because he hasn't got the connections with people around him in a loving connected way so that when he thinks about his own relationships potentially with his children which he's abusing clearly he probably doesn't have a very strong thread of feeling towards them so then he thinks well i don't really feel that much for these kids of my own so in his stereotypical biased brain he looks at black kids and thinks well people don't value those children as much as people would value my white children which is bizarre but that's his mindset and also culturally at the time that was probably something that was realistic in his head because clearly black people in america were treated very badly so he's making that assumption that that would mean that their own parents wouldn't love them and that's just so warped and the same with children with disabilities he's imagining well they're not perfect therefore why would they be loved and it's a horrible mindset but one that effectively gave him permission in his mind to go ahead and do these heinous acts he also starts to collect heinous implements implements of hell as he said they were called and these were basically to be used on his next victim so these included a meat cleaver a butcher's knife a small hand saw but implements of horror essentially when you think about them in the context of what i'm discussing today now we get to 1924 so albert fish at this point is 54 years of age and he is enduring a period of psychosis and he decided that god had basically told him that he needed torture and consume young children which just seems to be highly convenient for somebody who's a high level sadist that god's just like you know what fish you know what you need to do what what god because obviously i'm going to do whatever you say because you're god you're omnipotent i should always listen to you well i've just decided that i want you to go and torture and kill children really that sounds terrible well does it because you are a sadist and you do seem to get some kicks off this i know i'm just trying to act like i don't want to do it but i really do want to do it right well off you go it's a deeply religious conviction for both of us for you to go off and kill the most vulnerable individuals in our society what could possibly be less godly but anyway i also appreciate that people in psychosis do endure the strangest breaks from reality and feel commanded to do certain things but like i said 
I lost my dad to psychosis and the only threat he ever was was ultimately to himself psychosis does not make you a murderer and I do feel that Albert Fish is quite a manipulative character as well I think he understands how to procure kids I think he knows exactly what he wants to do so I'm not really buying into this idea that there's some kind of religious mania occurring where he's advised that he needs to go off and do his duty to God by killing and eating children so July the 11th 1924 Fish actually finds an eight-year-old girl called Beatrice Keel She's actually playing alone at the time on a parent's farm on Staten Island, New York. And he basically offers her money, says, come and look for some rhubarb with me. And like most kids, she was genuinely about to leave the farm. But fortunately, her mum chases Albert away. When we do psychological testing in the general population, as in studies, where we set up experiments and we watch how children react in circumstances where strangers come up to them. Let me tell you, as much as we want to convince our kids not to go off with adults, we constantly reinforce them with this bizarre idea that they have to respect all adults, that they need to do what adults say, because we want to prepare them for things like school, you know, where we're starting to regiment them and send them down that path where they will get used to being a good citizen and learning to work a certain amount of hours a day so that they can go off into the world and do that as adults. That's how it works. So... It's really not surprising that when adults go up to kids in the street and say, you need to come with me, or do you want to come and see, that a lot of children will give way to that. Now, not all children, but a high proportion. So that's what she's doing. Some guys come along and said, come and find some rhubarb with me. He probably was quite nice. Apparently, Albert Fish had a really nice kind of face when he was smiling. So she probably isn't feeling threatened. But fortunately, God prevails and she doesn't actually leave the farm with him. Now he returns later to the Keels barn. This is where he attempts to sleep there. But Beatrice's father actually discovers him and forces him to leave. Thank the Lord, because can we all be honest, I don't think it would have ended well at all for Beatrice should she have gone with him. And arguably the fact that he came back to the farm to sleep, that could well have been him again scoping it out and stalking her. So whilst Beatrice does manage to avoid being one of Fish's victims, it doesn't work out the same for Grace Bud. So on May the 25th, 1928, Fish sees this classified advertisement in the Sunday edition of the New York World, and it reads, young man, 18, wishes for position in the country. And it had Edward Bud, 406 West 15th Street, rooted down as the address to correspond with him if you could give him a position. So on May 28th, the then 58-year-old Fish visits the Bud family in Manhattan. This is under the pretense of hiring Edward. And he said, really, it was all a ruse. He wanted to kill Edward, mutilate him, and leave him to bleed to death. That was his plan. And he introduces himself to the family as Frank Howard, a farmer from Farmingdale in New York. So after this initial meeting, he promises to hire Edward Bud and his friends, saying that he'll send for them in a few days. Now, Fish didn't show up, but then he sends a telegram to the Bud family saying that he's sorry for this and actually says he's going to come on a later date. Now, when Albert Fish returns to the home of the Bud family, he meets Edward's younger sister, 10-year-old Grace Bud. Immediately, he becomes completely infatuated with her. And the thing about her older brother is he's quite a big guy. And the problem is that he's thinking to himself, well, I might have some issues taking this kid on. Whereas Grace is younger and it's going to be far easier to physically dominate. So at this point, he quickly makes up a story about having to attend his niece's birthday party. And Fish somehow manages to convince the parents, Delia Bridget Flanagan and Albert Francis Bud Sr. to let Grace accompany him to the party that evening. And you see, this is why... I don't buy in to this scenario that Albert Fish is somebody who's totally lost his mind because he's highly manipulative and very able to quickly come up with stories to get him what he requires. Now, they agree to let her go with him and they never see their daughter again. Now, newspapers did cover Grace's kidnapping and for six years, her abduction remained a complete mystery. And during this time, Fish was confined to a psychiatric hospital at one point for two months and he was discharged after that two months and considered not insane but that he had psychopathic personality of a sexual type 
which I think we all agree is clear from what I've told you about. Now, he has another brief marriage. So he marries Estella Wilcox. This is on February the 6th, 1930. This is in Waterloo, New York. And their marriage lasted for one week. One week. Had the icing on the cake even gone hard at that point? I mean, certainly, if I'd attended that wedding, I would have wanted to get my, the present. I would not have felt that there was an appropriate investment in their time working it out. But that's what happened. They divorced only one week late. Maybe she woke up one morning, went down to breakfast and was like, oh, Albert's left me a lovely letter. Look at that, a letter on the side. I'm just going to sit down with my morning cup of tea before the children get up and I'm going to read this loving letter full of, I don't know, romantic musings. And then as she opened it, the true horror of what she had married came out as she read exactly what was going on in her new husband's mind. So she vacated the relationship very quickly. He also gets arrested in 1931 because he's writing those obscene letters to women and actually the police investigate him and they find this well-used cat of nine tails in his room which is deeply harrowing when you think about what we know about his behaviour. Now they're desperate to figure out what happened to Grace and it takes a full six years before they get a substantial break in that case. And the reason for that is after Fish has got out of the psychiatric unit, after he's had time to mull and think about what he did to Grace, he wants to brag about it to some degree. So on November 11th, 1934, Mrs. Budd receives an anonymous letter and it notes the absolutely grotesque details of the murder and cannibalism of her beautiful daughter. Now, Mrs. Budd was sadly illiterate, as a lot of people were at the time, so she had to get one of her sons to read it to her, and I can't even begin to imagine how that son would have felt reading the words that they read. And the letter was left unsigned, but Albert Fish made it absolutely clear that it was written by Frank Howard, his alter ego at that time. So Fish wrote this letter describing how he'd arrived at the Bud's house, that he'd made up his mind to eat Grace and that she'd been allowed to go with him. So that he then took that as permission, took her to an empty house in Westchester that he'd already picked out. He told her to remain outside. She picked wildflowers. He then said, I went upstairs and I stripped all my clothes off. I went to the window and I called her. When she saw me all naked, she began to cry and tried to run. Fish went on to describe in horrific detail how Grace fought back and how he eventually overpowered her, which of course he would. He was a man. He then talked about choking her to death, cutting her body into pieces and cooking them. He then said that he consumed her remains over the next nine days. It is incalculably grotesque and distressing to be a mother being given that knowledge about their child. I cannot even begin to wrap my head around how she would have felt the guilt that she must have felt would have consumed her. She knowingly and willingly sent her daughter with that monster and she met a monstrous end because of that decision. I'm not blaming the mother, of course, she was completely innocent. She believed in this guy, but it just demonstrates that there were these monsters lurking in the shadows, rare they may be, but if you happen to be the rare statistic, how do you live with that? Now the letter, that's what leads to Albert's arrest, and it's interesting isn't it, because I think we can add narcissism to his sadism and psychopathy, and also his Machiavellianism, so we can throw in the whole dark triad there of personality traits, and narcissism is something that will often lead to these kind of killers tripping themselves up. Because, you know, they like to be superior, they like to be arrogant, they like to play with people, they like to be forensically involved in investigations, they like to place themselves in the centre to some degree. And writing that letter is his undoing, because now the investigators have something to go on. Clearly it's been written to cause massive panic, further distress to Grace Bud's family, but it essentially leads and hastens Albert Fish's downfall because the letter was delivered in an envelope that had this small hexagonal emblem with the letters NYPCBA, meaning New York Private Chauffeurs Benevolent Association. So now they're like, hang on, this is unique. 
This belongs to the New York Private Chauffeurs Benevolent Association. Therefore, who would have access to this? So then they start to track back and a janitor at the company tells the police that he'd actually taken some of his stationery home, but he'd left it at his rooming house at 200 East 52nd Street when he moved out. So then they go back and they see the landlady of that establishment and the landlady of that rooming house said, Albert Fish had checked out the same room a few days earlier. And she also said that Fish's son had sent him money and asked her to hold his check for him. So the next time that check arrived, because his father wasn't present at that time, he asked the landlady to hold it back and keep it safe. So now the investigators are like, well, hang on. This sounds like we can connect Fish with the room where the stationery had been left and he's coming back because there's a check being sent and there's one that's going to come after so that means he's going to return to this place and if we lie in wait we're going to be able to get our suspected guy detective william king who's the chief investigator for this case therefore waits outside the room until fish returns and fish did agree to go back to the station for questioning but then pulls out to raise the blade and threatens detective king with it but not in an effective manner because Detective King disarms him and then arrests him. So now Fish is in trouble, whatever, because he's just threatened a detective with a weapon. At this point, he gets detected. At this point, Fish is detained in Sing Sing, which is a maximum security prison. This is the one that he'd actually been incarcerated in previously. Fish surprisingly doesn't attempt to deny the murder of Grace Bud. In fact, he is almost tripping over himself to just confess all the grisly details of what he's done to her. And he adds to that that he's also harmed dozens of other children. And he stated that it never actually entered his mind to rape Grace. But later he said, that when he was kneeling on her chest and strangling her, he did actually have two involuntary ejaculations. So even though he's not saying that he wanted to sexually molest her, the mere fact of asphyxiating her and killing her was enough to bring him to sexual climax. I mean, that is a sexual sadist of the highest level. He's murdering a little girl. He's terrifying her during that actual execution. And all he feels is sexual gratification. This information actually at his trial was used to make the claim that the kidnapping was sexually motivated. But the reason that it's likely they did that was because they didn't then have to mention any of the cannibalism because it was a bizarrely higher charge because the kidnapping was sexually motivated. Now, there were lots of additional claims after his arrest. So Billy Gaffney, this was one of his victims. So on February the 11th, 1927, there was this three-year-old little boy, Billy Beaton, and his 12-year-old brother, they're playing in their apartment in a hallway in Brooklyn with a four-year-old called William Billy Gaffney. Now, when the 12-year-old left for his apartment, apparently both the younger boys just disappeared into thin air. Beaton, he was actually found on the roof of the apartment building. And when he was asked what had happened to Billy Gaffney, Beaton said, the bogeyman took him. Now, Billy Gaffney's body was never recovered. Initially, a serial killer called Peter Kudzinowski was a suspect in Billy Gaffney's murder. Then Joseph Meehan, who was a motorman on a Brooklyn trolley, he actually saw a picture of Fish in a newspaper and he identified that it was him that he had seen on February the 11th, 1927. And he noticed that he was quiet, trying to quiet a little boy who was sitting with him on the trolley who matched the description of Billy. So they realised that it's likely that they got the wrong serial killer when it came to this murder. And this particular guy who saw the trolley with the boy on it said the boy wasn't wearing a jacket, he was crying for his mother, and he was literally dragged by the man on and off the trolley. Just throwing it out there, if you do happen to see a child distressed, you know, not wearing a jacket, screaming for the mummy, with some old guy dragging them on and off the trolley, I don't know, throw it out there. Intervene! just drives me under when I literally hear these kind of tales where witnesses talk about seeing something that ultimately demonstrates the absolute distress of a child and they didn't actually go in there and ask what was happening, but they did. Now, Beaton's description of the bogeyman also matched Fish, as did that witness. 
And then the police matched the description of the child on the trolley to Billy Gaffney. And detectives who worked for the Manhattan Missing Persons Bureau, they were also able to establish that Fish was employed as a house painter by a Brooklyn real estate company during February 1927. And that on the day of Billy Gaffney's disappearance, he was working just a few miles down the road from where the boy was abducted. So I think we can safely say he was responsible for that murder. Billy's mother, Elizabeth Gaffney, she actually visited Albert Fish in Sing Sing, accompanied by Detective King. She just wanted to ask him about her son's death, but Fish refused to speak to her. However, what Fish did claim in a letter to his attorney was this. I brought him to the River Ave. There's a house there that stands alone, not far from where I took him. I took the G-boy there, stripped him naked and tied his hands and feet and gagged him with a piece of dirty tag I picked out of the dump. Then I burned his clothes, threw his shoes in the dump. Then I walked back and took the trolley to 59th Street at 2 a.m. And then I walked home from there. The next day, about 2 p.m., I took tools, a good heavy cat and nine tails homemade, short handle, cut one of my belts in half, slit these half in six strips about eight inches long. I whipped his bare behind till the blood ran from his legs. I cut off his ears, nose, slit his mouth from ear to ear, gouged out his eyes. He was dead then. I stuck the knife in his belly. I held my mouth to his body and drank his blood. I picked up four old potato sacks, gathered a pile of stones and I cut him up. I had a grip with me. I put his nose, ears and a few slices of his belly in the grip. Then I cut him through the middle of his body, just below the belly button, then through his legs, about two inches below his behind. I put those in my grip with a lot of paper. I cut off the head, feet, arms, hands and the legs below the knee. Then I put it in sacks and weighed with stones, tied the ends, threw them in the pools of slimy water you'll see along the road going to North Beach, water's about three to four feet deep. They sank at once. I came home with my meat. I had the front of his body I liked that best. His monkey and peewees and a nice little fat behind to roast in the onion and eat. I made a stew out of his ears, nose, pieces of his face and belly. I put onions, carrots, turnips, celery, salt and pepper. It was good. Then I split the cheeks of his behind open, cut off his monkey and peewees and washed them first. I put strips of bacon on each cheek of his behind and put it in the oven. Then I picked four onions and when the meat had roasted, I poured about a pint of water over it for gravy and put in the onions. At frequent intervals, I basted his behind with a wooden spoon so the meat would be nice and juicy. In about two hours, it was nice and brown, cooked through. I never ate any roast turkey that tasted half as good as his sweet little fat behind did. I ate every little bit of that meat in it. About four days it took me. His little monkey was as sweet as a nut. But his peewees, I couldn't chew. Threw them in the toilet. You can hear, can't you, from that letter to his attorney that he's enjoying it. I mean, we cannot say for absolute certain that he did go ahead and do that to the child because we have to be aware that he did used to like writing letters to shock other people using his sadistic fantasies. So we can't absolutely evidence that he did kill Billy, but they strongly suspect he did. And the very descriptive level of cooking the body, it feels so familiar to him that I wouldn't dispute it. I think that he did do that to that child. It fits in with the witness testimony and it's so descriptive. And like I said, he takes absolute pleasure in describing that. Another of his victims was Francis McDonnell. So during the night of July the 14th, 1924, a nine-year-old little boy, Francis McDonnell, was reported missing. He'd failed to return after he'd been playing catch with his friends in Port Richmond on Staten Island. They did a search for him and his body was found hanging by a tree in this wooded area near his home. It's just so traumatic to imagine that a little nine-year-old boy. He'd been sexually assaulted. Then he'd been strangled with his suspenders. Now, according to an autopsy, Francis had also suffered extensive lacerations to his legs and to his abdomen, and his left hamstring had almost entirely been stripped of its flesh. Now, Fish did refuse to claim responsibility for this, but later down the line, he did state that he'd intended to castrate Francis, but then he'd basically fled when he heard somebody approaching the area. Now, Francis's friends, they'd actually told the police that he'd been taken by an elderly man with a grey moustache, which matches the description of Albert Fish. And one of their neighbours, Hans Kiel, 
also told the police that he'd observed the boy with a similar looking man walking along a grassy path into the nearby woods. Francis's mother, Anna McDonnell, she said that she'd seen the same man earlier that day and she told reporters that he came shuffling down the street mumbling to himself and making these queer motions with his hands and she said that she saw his thick grey hair and drooping grey moustache. She said that everything about him seemed faded and grey and this description actually resulted in the mysterious stranger becoming known as the Grey Man. So when the police arrest Albert Fish for Grace Bud's murder, obviously they want to try to link him potentially with other unsolved crimes. So they actually get some of those eyewitnesses, including Hans Kiel, who was an eyewitness to the Grey Man that was seen, to come and see whether they recognised this man. And Hans Kiel did indeed positively identify Fish as that stranger who'd been around Paul Richmond on the day of McDonald's disappearance. In fact, there were several people who confirmed it was definitely him. Now, Richmond County District Attorney Thomas Walsh, he announced at the time of Fish being caught that his intention was to seat an indictment against Fish for the murder of Francis McDonald. At first, Fish denied these charges. It was only in March 1935. This is after the conclusion of his trial for the Bud murder and for his confession to the killing of Billy Gaffney, that he then confirmed to investigators that he did rape and murder McDonnell. When this was made public, the New York Daily Mirror wrote that his confession solidified Fish's reputation as the most vicious child slayer in criminal history. Now, understandably, he's banged to rights. He's going to be found guilty of these murders without a shadow of a doubt. And of course, it's whether he's going to get the death sentence. So they start the trial for the murder of Grace Budd. It begins on March the 11th, 1935. It begins in White Plains, New York. Frederick P. Close presides as the judge. The prosecuting attorney was Westchester County Chief Assistant District Attorney, Albert F. Gallagher. And the defense counsel was James Dempsey, who was a former prosecutor and a one-time mayor of Peekskill, New York. The trial lasted for 10 days. So understandably, they want to talk about what could have been going on in Fish's mind because is he sane, is he insane? And also there's this deviant behaviour that is just absolutely peppered through his life but certainly has amplified and exacerbated in murderous ways that I've described. So several psychiatrists are brought in to talk about his sexual fetishes and I think that probably it's a one-off in their careers because, you know, you do get clients and patients who are a little bit on the complex and deviant side but usually there's a level of expectation to their paraphilias you don't expect to get so many that they probably had to invent some for him these included sadism masochism flagellation so flogging exhibitionism voyeurism pickerism which is penetrating a person's skin with a sharp object cannibalism chlorophilia urophilia Hemosalignia, paedophilia, necrophilia, and infibulation, which is the ritual removal of female genitalia. Yeah, quite a list. I am genuinely imagining the psychiatrist probably needed a little bit of therapy themselves after interviewing him. So Dempsey, the defence counsel in his summation, noted that Fish was a psychiatric phenomenon, I think we can all agree on that, and that literally nowhere in legal or medical records was there another individual who possessed so many sexual abnormalities. The defence's chief expert witness was Frederick Retham. He was a psychiatrist who had an emphasis on child development and he conducted psychiatric examinations for the New York Criminal Courts. And during two days of testimony, Retham explained Fish's obsession with religious and specifically his preoccupation with the biblical story of Abraham and Isaac in the book of Genesis. So he had this massive preoccupation with that particular story. And Retham basically said that Fish believed that similarly, sacrificing a boy would be penance for his own sins. And that even if the act itself was wrong, angels would prevent it if God did not approve. Just going to throw it out there, that seems a little bit uncannily in the favour of fish there. Well, I have decided that I need to sacrifice and kill this child and I will know that God 
is approving of this because he will let me sacrifice and kill this child unless he stops me in which case i'll know it's a message from god not to sacrifice and kill this child no i haven't heard anything i'm gonna go ahead and sacrifice and kill this child like if that logic worked basically murderers everywhere would be allowed to get away with it by just saying well at the end of the day god didn't stop me and therefore it's not wrong it's a bit like me deciding today that i'm just going to go off and rob some banks and as long as i've got my gun and my mask and my getaway car go in get me money run off and at the end of the day unless the police arrest me at that point it was because god wanted me to steal that money simple as that bizarre but that's the logic and this psychiatrist is reporting that this is why fish acted that way and fish said that before he actually killed grace Ford, he had actually once tried to do it before but it got thwarted because a car had driven past so he hadn't been able to do it and then he had intended to actually kill edward bud as i talked about earlier on but because he was larger than expected fish had settled on grace even though he knew that grace was female the psychiatrist said that fish had actually perceived her as a boy during the killing now wortham then detailed fish's cannibalism because bear in mind he associated cannibalism apparently with communion so just to put it out there for those of you who don't know what communion is is a christian sacrament in which consecrated bread and wine are consumed and they're consumed as memorials of christ's death or as symbols of the realization of a spiritual union between christ and the communicants or as the body and blood of christ so it's a very sacred ritual essentially in christianity and this is what he's using so what the psychiatrist is saying is that in fish's apparent warped mind it was like a communion with him and god cannibalizing the organs and bodies of these children was basically this ritual that connected him with the divine now the last question that the defense attorney dempsey asked were them was 15,000 words long. I bet the jury were like, we do want to go home at some point. We've already decided, literally, this guy's guilty is going down. And I don't mean down as in to prison. I mean down as in to the depths of hell. Because clearly, 15,000 words is going to go on a bit of a time. So this question is framed basically detailing the whole of Fish's life. And the question ends by asking the doctor, the psychiatrist, what he considered Fish's mental condition to be. And Wortham simply answered, he is insane. Now, Gallagher, the prosecution, cross-examined Wortham on whether Fish knew the difference between wrong and right. He actually responded that he did know, but that it was a kind of perverted knowledge that was based on his opinions of sin, atonement, and religion. And so it was an insane knowledge. The rebuttal witnesses, so Menas Gregory, that was the former manager of the Bellevue Hospital where Fish was treated in 1930, they testified that Fish was abnormal but sane. And under cross-examination, Dempsey actually asked if the coraphilia, which is the fetish about eating feces and urophagia, which is a fetish about drinking urine, and paedophilia indicated a sane or insane person. And Gregory replied that such person was not mentally sick and that these were common perversions. I don't think they're that common with respect, just gonna throw it out there, but they were socially perfectly all right, and that Fish was no different from millions of others, some very prominent and successful, who had the very same perversions, which is, just gonna throw it out there, slightly alarming. This person who's medically qualified just in court going, look, he's not insane. Yeah, it's a little bit on the weird spectrum for some people, but actually it's really common. Everyone's eating poo, drinking urine, and abusing children. Really successful people do it. No big deal. Why is everyone looking at me weird? Honestly, literally, literally what this doctor said. The quote, socially, perfectly all right. I don't think they would say, I think you're probably a little bit of a deviant yourself and in your mind you frame that what Albert Fish is doing is sane because you think that paedophilia eating poo and drinking whey is okay. <laughs> Bizarre. The next witness was the resident physician at the tombs which was the Manhattan Detention Centre. They were called Perry Lichtenstein 
And Dempsey actually objected to this doctor because he said there was no training in psychiatry and therefore he shouldn't be testifying on the issue of sanity. But Justice Close actually overruled this on the basis that the jury could decide what weight to give a prison doctor. So the defence attorney is going, listen, I'm just going to, I'm just like, sorry, judge, I'm a little bit worried here because basically you've just brought in a doctor to testify on a psychiatric level without any psychiatric training. Is anyone else thinking that's a little bit wrong? And the judge is like, uh, honestly, after that 15,000 word question, I just, I've had enough. I've, I've, I've had enough. Like I, the jury are really, they're done. They, they've all, they decided, they decided right at the very beginning where we were going with this. So like, let's just, can we just call it a day? Has everyone agreed just to call it a day? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you, it's fine. You, the doctor with no training, crack on, crack on. It's okay. We'll get you home soon. We're going to send you home with a sandwich. But I, I know, I know we're going Gilly, but let's just, let's just humor him. So basically, yeah, overrules it and says that the jury have got the ability to decide what weight to give that prison doctor. Now, when they were asked whether Fish's self-harm indicated any kind of mental condition, Lichtenstein replied, that is not masochism, as he was only punishing himself to get sexual gratification. So he didn't just like... I know we're all tired in court now, jury, I appreciate you've had enough at this point, but can I, just as a general lay person, maybe I'm working in the canteen, I've just come to serve sandwiches, but I just want to ask and cross-examine that particular doctor from the prison. Did you just say, quote, that as far as you were concerned, that this is self-harm didn't actually indicate a mental condition? that it wasn't actually masochism because he was only punishing himself to get sexual gratification. So you're telling me that he was only punishing himself to get sexual gratification, but that that's not masochism. Yeah. That's the definition of masochism. Yeah, well, listen, I'm an in-house doctor at the prison, so you don't know anything about it. I might not be psychiatrically trained, but I'm telling you, it's not masochism. I'm telling you, it's the definition of masochism. Do you work in the canteen? Why are you even commenting? You're not medically qualified. I know, but neither are you when it comes down to this. And any layperson in their right mind knows that that is genuinely the definition of masochism. Judge, what are you going to suggest? I suggest that they should listen to you from the canteen because at the end of the day, you're also not medically qualified. The jury can make a decision based on what you've said as well. Honestly, literally guys, it is the definition of masochism. Bonkers. But nevertheless, this was all kicking off in the court and this is what they were being told and the jury, like I said, probably didn't need to hear any of this because they've already decided, I believe, where this man is going. Now, Charles Lambert, he testified that chorophilia was a common practice and that religious cannibalism may be psychopathic, but was a matter of taste and not evidence of psychosis. It deeply concerns me that that was even said. So basically, they're saying that he's sane and that cannibalism might not be seen as an acceptable reality in our Western civilization, but it's a matter of taste. If you happen to like tasting children's bodies when they're cooked and cannibalized, then crack on. It's wrong, but it doesn't mean that you're mad. Arguably, I would say that cannibalism isn't a sign of psychosis, so that's fair comment, but I'm not necessarily agreeing that somebody like Fish is sane. Another witness, James Vassivore, he repeated Lambert's opinion that religious cannibalism might be psychopathic, but that it isn't actually evidence of psychosis. Mary Nicholas, so that's Fish's 17-year-old stepdaughter, she testified that Fish actually taught her and her brothers and sisters several games involving overtones of masochism and child molestation. So again, they're bringing witnesses who can actually identify that this had been a long-standing issue with Fish. And when it came down to the verdict, Let's be honest, none of the jurors for one minute thought that Fish wasn't insane. They all thought he was. No matter who was bringing in this information saying that he was just somebody with these fetishes and that he knew what he was doing, they did believe that even though 
he did to some degree know what he was doing. It also came from a level of insanity. And I think when you think about his family dynamics, that kind of plays through on a genetic level to some degree. But ultimately, in spite of the fact that he was considered insane by the jurors, they found him guilty and said that the reason they felt he should be executed and receive the death penalty was because his actions were just so reprehensible. So in spite of knowing that things were not right with Albert Fish, they found Albert Fish to be sane and guilty. And so Judge Close at that point sentenced Fish to death by electrocution. So Fish is found guilty, sent to prison, which happens in March 1935, and he was actually executed on January the 16th, 1936, in the electric chair at Sing Sing. He entered the chamber at 11.06 and was pronounced dead three minutes later, and he was buried in the Sing Sing prison cemetery. Fish is actually said to have helped the executioner position the electrodes in his body, and his last words were reportedly, I don't even know why I'm here. I have a list. Sorry. It could have been that he was dealing with psychotic break. It could be in mental decline. He could genuinely have been confused, disorientated. But I can't help but throw in that I'd have just been like, no matter what you are, I've got the list here. I shall read out why you are here. And it's going to take some time. And that's not even before I get to the list on your sexual perversions. Anyway, according to one of the witnesses who were present, it actually took two jolts before Fish died. So two lots of the electric charge and that created these rumours that the electric chair had been short-circuited because of the needles that Fish had inserted into his groin in the practice of that self-harm years ago. And with respect, when they did x-rays on him, they did find loads of corroded metal in his body from when he'd done that. But these rumours were later disregarded, apparently they were all untrue. Fish reportedly died in exactly the same fashion in the same time frame as others who died in the electric chair. Now, at a meeting with reporters in the aftermath after the execution, Fish's lawyer, James Dempsey, revealed that he was in possession of his client's final statement. This apparently resulted in several pages of handwritten notes that Fish apparently penned in the hours just prior to his death. When the journalists were like, tell us what's in them, which we all would be like, immediately publish them, please. The attorney who'd represented him said, I will never show it to anyone. It was the most filthy string of obscenities that I have ever read. So, Fish really was the same Fish that we knew right until the moment where he was executed. Now, the victims that we are absolutely sure of were murdered by Fish between 1924 and 1928 were... Francis McDonnell, he was aged eight, Billy Gaffney, aged four, and Grace Ford, who was aged ten. But he is suspected of committing quite a lot of other murders, even though he denied them. But he was a suspect in at least another 12. Detective William King believed that Fish may have been the Brooklyn vampire, who was a rapist and murderer, who mainly preyed on children and teenagers in and around the New York City area. So Yetta Abramovics was a 12-year-old who was strangled and beaten on the roof of a five-storey apartment in Simpson Street in the Bronx on May 14th, 1927. She died in hospital shortly after she was found and a guy exactly looking like Fish was noted having tried to lure several individuals that day into hallways and alleyways. So it looks like that could well have been him. Also 16-year-old Mary Ellen her body that was mutilated was found in woods close to a house that Fish had been painting in Far Rockaway, Queens, on February the 15th, 1932. Fish also claimed to have sexually assaulted at least 100 boys, most of whom were African-American or had developmental disabilities. He also suggested that he'd murdered a child in each of the 23 states in which he'd lived which is truly horrifying and just demonstrates the sadism and the thirst for killing that Albert Fish had. And even though we can say that he was certainly an individual who had delusions, without a shadow of a doubt, the letter that he wrote to Mrs. Budd about her gorgeous daughter Grace clearly demonstrated that he had taken her life and that he had cannibalized her daughter and that means that we have to believe that so many of the other murders that went unsolved were likely attributed to this killer. And when you think about children growing up and being warned about strangers and being scared about the possibilities and potentials of these individuals who steal you in the night and do the whole heap of horrible things I've described, the sad thing is that for some children this came true where Albert 
fish is concerned. To this day, children so often are told spooky bedtime stories about the bogeyman. They're warned by adults to be good or else they'll be kidnapped and eaten by this monster. But little do these terrified kids know the stories are actually true because Albert Fish genuinely was that child-eating monster. Ugh, absolutely horrifying. I would love to know your thoughts on this case. Have I told you something you didn't know? Have I informed you about something that you were unaware of? Do you know any additional information that you want to share with me? Please let me know in the comments because it is truly terrifying to imagine that these individuals may start off as victims, but in the end become the most brutal and torturous murderers themselves. Let me know your thoughts and as always, be safe guys.